Hello. Welcome, everyone. This is amazing. Of course, I did tell them that Sherry would sell out, but they didn't believe me. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. I'm Lindy Gifford, and it is truly my pleasure to and honor to introduce our speaker tonight, Sherry Mitchell. Um, Sherry will be taking questions and then signing books at the end of the program, but you'll hear more about how that works later. First, I have a few announcements. Um, who, I just want to know who here has heard Sherry speak at um, the Healing Turtle Island event? Okay, well, that's an event that happens. Um, it's going to be in July, and I think we have the dates on a table in the back. And it's an incredible event, and um, they really need money. And all of the um, proceeds, donations tonight, go to that. So it's really important that you guys fill up those baskets. I think they're out in the lobby there. And I wanted you to know a couple of things. You might not know that the idea for this event came from an unaffiliated group of nine of your neighbors and friends. We originally started as a Wabanaki reach group, and we meet together and explore and study Wabanaki culture and history and the impacts of white supremacy and colonization on indigenous peoples, especially in Maine. And tonight there are, it is the first in a series of events and there's information at the back tables about other events that will be happening. So I also want to tell you that when Sherry said to us, this small group, that she could come, we went straight to the Lincoln Theater because we wanted the biggest venue in town. And they immediately embraced the idea of hosting her. And it's through their generosity that we were able to offer this program free of charge. And the Lincoln Theater offers many programs free of charge. <laughs> and I also would like you to join with me in thanking our four sponsors, the Ch Chowanke, Damerscotter River Association, Midcoast Conservancy, and people united against racism. And we hope that after this event, you will take this opportunity to make connections and talk with your neighbors about what we hear tonight. Because I don't know if I've ever been in a room with so many of the people in these towns who are already working for a better future for all people and all beings. But the important part is Sherry. Sherry Mitchell was born and raised on the Penobscot Indian Reservation. She received her undergraduate degree from the University of Maine and received her Juris Doctorate and a Certificate in Indigenous Peoples Law and Policy from the University of Arizona's James E. Rogers College of Law. Sherry is an alumni of the American Indian Ambassador Program and the Udall Native American Congressional Internship Program. In 2010, she received the Mahoney Dunn International Human Rights and Huna, Human, Humanitarian Award for research into human rights violations against indigenous peoples. In 2015, she received the Spirit of Maine Award for commitment and excellence in the field of international human rights. In 2016, Sherry's portrait was added to the esteemed portrait series, Americans Who Tell the Truth, by artist Robert Shatterley. And she is a recipient of the 2017 Hands of Hope Award for the Peace and Justice Center of Eastern Maine. Sherry was a longtime advisor to the American Indian Institute's Healing and Future Program and currently serves as an advisor to the Indigenous Elders and Medicine People's Council of North and South America. She is the founding director of the Land Peace Foundation, an organization dedicated to the global protection of indigenous rights and the preservation of indigenous way of life. Prior to forming the Land Peace Foundation, Sherry served as a law clerk on the solicitor of the United 
to the solicitor of the United States Department of Interior as an associate with Fredericks, Peebles, and Morgan Law Firm, and a civil rights educator for the Maine Attorney General's Office, and she was the staff attorney for the Native American unit of Pine Tree Legal. Sherry speaks and teaches around the world on issues of indigenous rights, environmental justice, and spiritual change. Her broad base of knowledge allows her to synthesize these many subjects into a cohesive whole, weaving together the legal, political, and spiritual aspects surrounding a multitude of complex issues. Her work is featured in the documentary film titled Dancing with the Cannibal Giant, released in October of 2017 by New Story Film. And her first book, Sacred Instructions, is now in print and available here. Sherry is also the co-host of the radio program Love and Revolution Radio, which focuses on real-life stories of heart-based activism and revolutionary spiritual change. So please join with me in welcoming Sherry Mitchell. Quay, Guanu, hello and welcome. And Dali we see one of Hamukasit uh Naji open a whipskake, and Dona Bama Gawasus no open a whipskake, uh Nagakakakus uh Niltzabaik. My name is uh Sherry Mitchell from the Penobscot Nation. My family is Bear Clan from the Penobscot Nation and Crow Clan from the Pasmaquati tribe at Zibaik. Uh Nalit Hasyu and Diane, I'm very happy to be here with you tonight. So thank you very much for, for welcoming me. <clears throat> one of my favorite quotes is by a uh, crow elder named Shiskro, and what Shiskro said was, the soil you see beneath your feet is not ordinary soil. It is the dust, the flesh, and the bone of my ancestors. And so the soil beneath this building contains the dust, the flesh, and the bone of my ancestors. And I would like to ask you all to take a moment, and those who are able, stand with me to recognize the presence of those ancestors here on this land. Julie, thank you very much. Please be seated. I'm terrible about talking with my hands, and I had that bracelet on, and I was warned that if I hit this with any degree of uh, uh, pressure that, that it was going to make a big loud noise, so I figured I should probably just take it off just to be safe. Uh, so how many of you have read the book? Just a few. So why did you come? <laughs> See, that's not the response you want when you ask a question of an audience. You don't want to hear crickets. <laughs> Thank you. Please silence your phones. So I want to talk a little bit about the book, and then I want to talk about a few other things, and then I'm going to open it up, because I would like for us to have a discussion. So are we in agreement on that? Does that sound good? So I have had the incredible honor of working with um, some of the indigenous spiritual elders across the Americas for the past 30 years, and have learned a great deal from them, I've learned a great deal from my own family, and was instructed by some of those elders uh, several years ago to begin doing this work out in the world. And uh, I resisted it for, for a while, 
uh, and then I accepted it, and uh, then I embraced it, and began moving um, out into the world in a way that I had never been before. I had always been uh, activist, I had always been outspoken about injustice, I had always been outspoken about um, racial issues, indigenous rights issues, environmental issues, but at the request of those elders, I began going out into the world with all of who I am fully embodied. I was no longer trying to live individual lives. I was allowed, given permission by them to live one life. I think so often because of the society that we live in, we think that we have to be different people in different scenarios. So we're one person when we're at home with our family, uh, we're somebody else when we're applying for a job. You know, we want to look good on paper. Um, we're somebody else when we're around our spiritual community. We're somebody else when we're out with our friends and nobody's looking. And, you know, if you're uh, one of that generation that swipes left or right, you know, then you're, then you're a different person then as well. And so that's part of the mainstream society's way of thinking is that we have to be broken down, fragmented, and commodified into saleable parts. And so there was a period of time where I bought into that nonsense, where I thought, well, I have to be, you know, this person here, and this person here, and this person here, and this whole idea of wearing many hats um, was one that was so broadly accepted that uh, I didn't think a lot of it until I really started to get to know who I was and I started to see the fractures within my own being in relation to having to be fragmented in that way. And so when the elder said, we want you to take these teachings that you carry within you and we want you to start sharing them in everything that you do. We want you to step into this role um, that we're asking you to take on. Uh, when they offered me my name, Wanahamukwasit, uh, and I humbly accepted that name, I was responsible for taking on that role. And so what I realized at that time was that this was actually giving me permission to live one life. It was giving me permission to bring all of who I am into everything that I do so that I could show up in every moment of my life, whether I'm dealing with a legal issue, an environmental issue, a social justice issue, a spiritual issue, um, I could be present, fully embodied as who I am in totality. What an incredible gift. And so one of the things that I want to do tonight is I want to give you all permission to live one life. In case you need someone to tell you that it's okay. And I want you to look at each other at some point tonight, maybe right now, you know, look at somebody sitting next to you and say, you have permission to be all of who you are. Go ahead, do it. It's scary, but just do it. <laughs> and it's a terrifying prospect at first you know, to think about what does it mean to be all of who I am in the world. And we can't become all of who we are in the world if we don't heal the illusion of separation that has been ingrained within us. If we don't let go of these false ideas of otherness that have defined our relationships with one another as human beings for the last two millennia and then some. We can't be all of who we are if we don't understand how our individual being fits into the larger scheme of creation. And so the impetus for writing the book was twofold. It was to help people to find a pathway to help during this very critical time, as well as being an introduction it's really a basic introduction. Those of you who have read the book are probably rolling your eyes. But it is very basic. And that's what the elder said. 
you need to put the information out there to start the conversation, but be gentle at first. And so even though we're looking at truths that are uncomfortable, that are painful, this is really just an introduction. It's helping to show a pathway for us about where we've been together and also create a map for us of where we can go in the future. And I wanted to begin introducing these concepts of what we call Skajinawebha Mausawagin. And what that is, is this way of life that is lived in harmony with the rest of creation. Because when you hear about Native American religion or spirituality, um, it's trivialized in a lot of ways. We're only allowed to exist in caricaturized sound bites. And so even the imagery that's been portrayed about our love of the earth in the media, how many of you remember the Sicilian man with the tear rolling down his face who was supposed to be native? You remember that commercial? Yeah, we're not even allowed to star in our own commercial. Right, so the images of us that have been portrayed out in the world don't accurately reflect who we are. And Scott Mamaday, who's a Kiowa author, um, he is an, another one who is very quote worthy. And what he says is, we are who we imagine ourselves to be. Our very existence consists in our imagination of ourselves. And our job is to imagine who and what and that we are completely. And the greatest tragedy that can befall us is to go unimagined. And so we as uh, Skijinawak people, uh, as Native people, Indigenous people, we've gone unimagined in um, the eyes of the larger population because we have not been able to present an imagining of ourselves as we know ourselves to be. I look out over this um, pop culture spirituality movement that's going on around the developed world. And you see all of these individuals who are speaking. And there are a couple of them who, you know, are fairly well known, who have, you know, uh, radio shows and all of these other things out there. Um, and you know what they've done? They've studied with indigenous people. And so they're allowed to speak on their behalf. But if you are an indigenous person, you don't get that platform, or we haven't up to this point. And so the true depth of meaning within our spiritual life, this way of life that we call Skijinawepamosawagan, has been left unimagined. It has never been allowed its place within the great wisdom traditions of the world. So how many of you have ever heard some of these cliched phrases in relation to Native peoples? How many of you have heard about uh, Native American oral traditions? Right, it means that we're storytellers. We share our history and our legends and our teachings through oral tradition. And so if you ask, why does that happen? I've actually asked um, some of these historians, linguists and others, why do you suppose that happened? And they said, well, you didn't have any form of writing. That's untrue. We did have forms of writing. And all you have to do is look at the old wampum belts and other um, things that were captured that have a very clear form of writing attached to them. We have these oral traditions which have been dismissed and diminished by the historical, archeological, and scientific communities as being unreliable uh, because they're not written down. Not only because it creates you know, this form of continuity in our lives, with the continuation of these unfolding stories, 
but also because we understood some of these real foundational laws of the universe on a much deeper level than we were ever allowed to explain. And so if we're going to take our place in this evolution of consciousness that's taking place that is lining up to attempt to provide us with the continuation of the right to live here in this beautiful place with one another, then we have to be able to step forward and share what we know to be true. And some of the things that we know to be true is that what we speak creates form. That we live in a vibrational universe. When we talk about the web of life, it's not just you know a family tree or these physical relationships that we have with one another. When we talk about the web of life, what we're talking about is quantum entanglement. Because we understood the way that we are connected in an energetic and spiritual way. We understood that we all came from the same seed of life, that we're all comprised of stardust and water. We understood that any matter that was once connected physically, as in that one seed of life, can never be disconnected spiritually or energetically. And if we look at the universe, images of the universe, it looks like a giant web. We understood that imagery on a spiritual level. So when we talk about the web of life, we're talking about an understanding that we are deeply emotionally and spiritually connected with the entire creation because we know and understood these concepts that science now calls quantum entanglement. How, have you, how many of you have ever heard of this thing called quantum, uh, I mean, phantom limb theory? So this phantom limb theory is that, you know, when, when somebody has an amputation, they can still, you know, their leg is amputated below the knee, they can still feel their foot. So if you understand what I just told you about our concept of web of life, awareness, you know now why that foot still itches. Because any matter that was once connected physically can never be disconnected spiritually or energetically. And so that's something that we've always understood. And so we understand that, uh, you know, the way that we speak creates vibrations that go out and connect with other organized matter and create new forms within the reality that we're living together. We understood genetic memory. When we tried to talk about that 100, 150, 50, 25 years ago, we were told that we were crazy and superstitious. Now science understands that genetic memory is actually passed down from one person to another, from one generation to another. That we have memory that actually lives within our DNA. And so the telling and the retelling of those stories actually sends out a vibrational frequency that connects with that genetic memory that we hold activates it, opens it, and encodes us with this ancient way of being and understanding about who we are in relation to life. It's pretty cool. You know, and when I started understanding the depth of knowledge and wisdom that is contained within our way of life, within our core teachings that have been so trivialized by the mainstream, I got really upset. But then I got really thankful because the lack of awareness and understanding about who we are and what we've known has protected that information. It's protected the keepers of that knowledge in some ways. It's protected those um, concepts from being diluted 
from being manipulated. And so when we start to understand the connection that we have to these foundational principles of the universe and the power that we have to create as a result of them, that when we're... Um, how many of you have ever heard a song on the radio and suddenly you're transported to another place in time? If it's a love song, you're going to be able to smell the way that your beloved smells, right? How you felt during that time. How many of you have ever heard somebody, you know, retelling a story about something from your childhood and then all of a sudden you start to remember greater detail about that time that triggers other memories that are connected to that. Suddenly that whole time period comes into sharp focus for you. This is what our ancestors understood about the maintenance of our oral tradition. That, that vibrational frequency that connects through sound, memories that are triggered through sound, the memories that they were passing down through us through our genetics. That sound vibration that connects to those memories and awakens and enlivens them. They understood that the transmission of that information through our oral traditions was going to keep the living essence of those teachings available for the next generation and the generation after that. They understood that when somebody enthusiastically tells a story, uh, if you've ever seen any of our storytellers, um, it's a sight to behold. You know, they really em emote strongly. And they really elicit that same emotion from the people who are listening to them talk. And so we were encouraged to incorporate our own understandings into the stories that were being told. You know, you don't just tell the story the way that this other guy told it. You let that story come inside you and live inside you and then you tell that living story. The wisdom in that is that there's these things called mirror neurons. And what happens is that when somebody is either witnessing an event or hearing the retelling of that event with emotion attached to it, the mirror neurons in their neocortex ignite and their bodily responses are exactly the same as if they had had that experience themselves. All of this wisdom was contained in our oral traditions. This understanding of our connectivity through these web of life teachings. And so there's also these shamanic principles that are connected with healing. So you know, there's all of these jokes about native people doing rain dances. Maybe you've heard one or two. Maybe you've told one or two. Maybe you've suggested on a really dry summer that we need to get somebody over here to do a rain dance. And so the understanding that's connected to that, which is very um, erroneous, is that, oh, Native people are really connected to nature, so they talk to the clouds, and uh, they talk to the rains, and the, you know they tell them that, that we need them to come. A shamanic understanding is that we are part of one universe, one living system having individual experiences of ourselves simultaneously, that we are one body of matter that was once connected physically, that can never be disconnected spiritually or energetically. And we don't pray to the rain, we become the rain. And so that practice of shamanic healing is about stepping into the sphere of active creation, being able to shift the elements within that creation 
and create a new outcome. And so when we think about that in relation to patterns of energy, understanding that there are patterns of energy that are moving in a specific direction, they've been moving in a specific direction for a very long time. We think about genocide, we think about conquest, we think about racial conflict, we think about inequity, we think about false ideas of superiority and entitlement. All of these patterns of energy that have been in play for a very, very long time. And we think about understanding these fundamental laws of the universe that a shaman can step into that flow of active creation, stop a pattern that is aligned with sickness, restructure it, and move it in a different direction. What does that sound like? It sounds to me like the laws of motion. It sounds to me like an understanding that once a body is set in motion, it will stay in motion unless it meets with an equal or greater force. And so the shaman becomes that equal or greater force that that energy pattern meets with. And so when we think about all of the different things that are in motion right now, that have been in motion for millennia, that we are connected to, when we think about all of those things that I just named, environmental destruction as well, illusion of separation, the mental illness of othering, the spiritual illness that is at the heart of the destruction of life in all forms, we can recognize that those are energetic patterns that are in motion. And if we hope to be able to create real change in the world, what we have to do is we have to learn to become a shaman. Doesn't mean I want you to go take a weekend course and get a certificate that tells you that you're a shaman. I, I don't want you to do that. Please don't do that. What it means is that we have to understand the connectivity that we have to the entire creation. It means that we have to get over our childlike dependence that leaves us waiting for someone else to tell us what to do or to fix our problems. It means that we have to understand the power that we have as active creators of the reality that we're sharing. And we have to confront those energy patterns of thought that have picked up such powerful momentum. Together, we have to stop them. We have to reorganize the energy within them. Restructure the neural pathways and move it into a different direction together. And that is what this book is all about. It's about us engaging that process together. It's about us engaging in what we call this act or process of samognis. Samognis is a warrior um, philosophy that means exerting just enough pressure to stop the flow of harm coming at you without harming the other. It is a practice of recognizing that all life is sacred. You can't stand in a protective stance for life if your goal is to harm the lives of others. So if we're going to stand in protection of life, just as the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota people did at Standing Rock, then that stand has to be peaceful and prayerful and hold life reverently. Even when they're being viciously attacked by trained attack dogs, having their arms nearly blown off by concussion grenades, being shot with high-pressure cannons full of water 
in the middle of the night in sub-zero temps, being shot by rubber bullets, tear gas, pepper spray. They still have to hold that prayerful protective stance because you can't stand for the protection of life and destroy life or dishonor life in any form. And that's the difficult part of what it is that we're trying to do together. Because what we're trying to do together is we're trying to create a new way of being in relationship with one another. And what many of us think that that means, or many of you, is that we need to get rid of those who are in power and replace them with someone who thinks more like us. You know what that's called? That's called conquest. And we've seen it for thousands of years. And so even though we may find certain people in the world despicable, even though we may find them intolerable, we cannot make a stand for the protection of life and seek to harm the lives of others. We cannot continue engaging in acts of conquest, whether that be mental, physical, emotional, or spiritual, and hope to achieve anything other than the repetition of conquest on the other side. So that's the very difficult part about the work that we're trying to do right now, is how do we engage this process of protecting life without harming life? How do we look beyond our differences, transcend them, integrate into the whole of our being, and then cycle forward together in the evolution of our consciousness? The first step in doing that is recognizing that oneness does not equal sameness. Many of us think that if we all just, you know, believe the same things, if we all dressed the same way, if we all ate the same food, if we all had the same understandings, then it would be fine, especially if people thought like we did. Because that would be the easiest for us, right? We wouldn't have to change. If everybody just can think like me, then, you know, we're all good. It's all good. So we take our examples of balanced living from the natural world. Have you ever seen one ecosystem that is made up of parts that are all exactly the same? Have you ever seen one living thing, one living thing that doesn't have individualized parts that come together and work in harmony to make that one living thing into a fully functioning, healthy being? If we want to have fu uh, fully functional, healthy societies, we need to have diversity. So what that means is we need to be able to address our self-destructive tendencies in a way that doesn't destroy life, that doesn't destroy or harm others. We have to be willing to recognize the things that are wrong and that need to be changed. And we need to engage the majority of our time and energy into creating solutions that allow for us to move forward together. And so in the book I talk about what's called the 80-10-10 rule. The five people in the room that have read the book probably remember this. It was, you know, it was really nice out today, too, so I appreciate you being here. I, I recognize what a big commitment that is, you know, what a, 
honor it is for, for me to have you here when you could be, you know, still outside enjoying the remnants of this beautiful day. So, yeah, uh, Wooly One, thank you. So we have to be willing to recognize that there are things that need to be changed. And there are forces that seem so beautiful that are actually working against us being able to do that in some regards. So when we think about uh, pop culture spirituality, I want you to tell me the truth. How many of you have ever made a vision board? How many of you have positive affirmations on your bathroom mirror? Right? We have to stay positive. And that's true. We do. And the vision boards really work. You know? And so every new energy pattern comes in on an existing pattern so that the entry into the mainstream is effortless. So when we think about these uh, not so new, what we've always understood as the laws of creation, um, now being called the laws of abundance and laws of attraction, when we think of how those came in to the mainstream, what track did they come in on? They came in on the most common, easily accessible track of Consumption, effortless consumption, consumption without even having to try, right? All you gotta do is you gotta cut out a picture of, you know, your dream partner, you know, aim high, right? A beautiful new truck or a car, you know, or a bike, whatever your pleasure, you know, uh, a house where you could walk around for three days and not see another person living there. You cut out the picture, you put them on your vision board, you sit in front of it every day, you bring up the emotion of how wonderful it's gonna to be to have those things. Maybe your new partner's putting a big diamond on your finger, right? And because we are powerful creators, we can manifest those things. And we can mindlessly consume on an energetic and spiritual level, not just physically anymore. So we can get the new partner without thinking about whether or not they're really right for us, you know? We can get the new vehicle without thinking about how much is it gonna pollute the environment or how much is it going to cost us to insure it or to run it. We can get the new house without thinking about how much the taxes might be on it. We can get the big diamond without thinking about the child who's losing their arm in the process of getting that for us. We can have every bit of new gadgetry without thinking about the fact that it is connected to the life of some other person or some other living being within the natural world. And we can have all of those things. So it's like the child saying, mom, I want a new bike. And the mom saying, well, I don't have enough money. And the child saying, but I want the bike. Because all they understand is that they want the bike. They don't understand about going out and working and making money and paying bills and saving money and, and the whole process that's necessary. They just see that I want this new bike. I wanna have what all of my friends have. There's no concept of everything that's connected to that. They don't understand that somebody is mining the metal to make that bike and all of the other steps that go into the creation of that bike and the acquisition of that bike. And that's how we've been as a society in relation to the laws of creation, laws of attraction, laws of abundance. Because we've failed to realize this concept that we call uh, in Dilna Bamuk. 
So in Dilna Bamak means for all my relations. And whenever uh, we pray, whenever we come together, whenever we ask for anything in a public way, when we speak in a public way, we're always taught at the end of that, you have to say, Basilda uh, and Dilna Bamak, because you have to recognize that everything that you're asking for yourself, everything that you're putting out into the world, everything that you're creating with the vibrations of your speech, your thoughts, your emotional energy, is impacting the entire creation. And so people have separated themselves from this concept of Indil Nabamuk because they don't recognize how deeply they're connected to one another and to the rest of life. And so when we ask for these things and we have the capacity to create them, we think that it's magic, right? It's kind of like putting your tooth under the pillow and the next day there's money. But now it's time for us to evolve our thinking. It's time for us to spiritually mature. It's time for us to use what we've discovered through those laws of creation and work together to actively create a world in which we want to live. To actively create a world that supports, sustains, nurtures, and cultivates life. And that begins with changing our value system, which brings me all the way back to the beginning of the talk. So when we think about the world in which we live where we have to commodify ourselves and break ourselves down into individual saleable parts, even when somebody is single, what do we say about them? They're on the market. So even our most personal and intimate relationships have been commodified into saleable aspects. So how do we change the way that we're seeing our relationship as matter that was once connected physically, that's never connect, disconnected energetically or spiritually, as a vibrational universe that has the ability to create through the emission of sound and emotional energy? How do we separate the reality of our ability to influence the lives that we're living from this value structure that makes us feel that everything is for sale and that the highest measure of value is profit. So that we can acquire more stuff. So that we can keep filling this empty space within us as we engage in what we call the dance of the cannibal giant. The cannibal giant is a figure within our mythology who lives deep in the forest and sleeps throughout time and only awakens to one specific cry of the Earth Mother. The cannibal giant remains asleep until the Earth Mother cries out and that particular cry lets the cannibal giant know that human beings are harming the Earth Mother faster than she can heal and they are consuming faster than she can produce. So the cannibal giant awakens and dances the people into this hypnotic state where they continue to consume endlessly and at faster and faster and faster rates until they consume themselves off the earth. And then the earth mother has the opportunity to renew and to heal herself. We are now in the grip of the dance of the cannibal giant. And the only way for us to put the cannibal giant back to sleep is for us to wake up. And the way that we wake up is to realize that we have this urgent need to decolonize our minds, to disassociate our way of being in the world with false sense of values that make us believe that profit is more important than people in the planet that drive us to make decisions that balance the economy and the earth in this totally unequal measure 
that places prophets before all else. We have to change the way that we think about value. We have to take profit, remove it from our valuation list completely, and put life at the very top of that value structure again. And so, if you read my book, um, you're going to, I hope, see that what this is, is it's a map for us to engage those processes. It's a map for us to begin to see how have our minds been conditioned and deluded. How have we been um, programmed to believe these false narratives of separation and otherness? How have we been hypnotized into believing that repeating the same acts of conquest are going to someday give us peace? How have we been fooled into thinking that anything other than open, heart-based, compassionate understanding is going to save humanity and Mother Earth? And so the book is really an invitation from everybody within my line that I've learned from, from me, to everyone that reads it to join me in this process of waking up from the dance of the cannibal giant so that we can begin to move humanity away from the self-destructive path that we're on and back towards life. And because life is worth saving, it's sacred and it's precious. And so now I'm going to open the floor up to your questions. You can ask me anything. You can ask me about the book. You can ask me about anything I've talked about. You can ask me what I had for dinner. Um, you can ask me anything you'd like. Oh, there you are. <laughs> it's nice to see you. I'm kind of blind. Thank you. And so there are people in the audience who have, um, on the floor, who have microphones. So just raise your hand and they'll come to you with a mic. Sherry, thank you. Thank you very much for welcome. coming. Um, could you share a little bit um, how the work at Nibizum is connected with what you've been talking about, just as you have some time here? Yeah. Um, well, Nibizum is an organization. It's the first land conservation project um, for native peoples in the state of Maine. So that's a big deal. Um, and Nabizan is located on lands that used to be part of the traditional homelands of the Penobscot people. And it's really the only land connection to Olemon Island, which was our traditional village, um, home of the red paint people, where our ancestors come from. Our ancestors are the red paint people. And so, um, you know, Nibizan is, uh, the word Nibizan comes from the word Nibi, which is water, which is our first medicine, and Nibizan is our medicine. And so um, Nibizan is this property that has been acquired by a collective of um, native peoples from the Wabanaki tribes, and it is being developed as a place of healing, and cultural uh, and spiritual development, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, and we are now in the process, um, I'm working to help them because Healing Turtle Island um, has become located there, um, and rightly so, to help them to secure that land because the, these people were all very poor. <laughs> they didn't have any money. And the property was being sold by Suffolk University for like $700,000 a lot of money. And so they had to put down, uh, you know, 
whatever they had, and they got this ridiculous two-year loan for that amount of money where they had to pay 150000 of it last year, and this year they have to pay 550000 of it by October. So I've been helping them to get the funds to secure that property, and um, we have a long way to go, but we're in the process of doing that, and, um, and the Beeson has attracted people from all walks of life, from all over. Um, during the Healing Turtle Island ceremony last year, we were able to bring people from every continent except Antarctica to Nabisan. Um And so, uh, you know, Healing Turtle Island is a very powerful ceremony, and so having it located at Nabisan, uh is exactly the right decision. And, um, and the, you know, the connection between the healing of Turtle Island and the healing and reconnecting and reuniting of the relationships of the Wabanaki people to those traditional homelands that we were kind of driven off from. Uh, even though we still own the island, Willem, and we were driven off from that by the logging industry years and years ago and all forced to be on this little tiny island. So, yeah. Other questions about anything else? I believe that when you have uh, something that really makes you feel a very spiritually positive, it could be your love for animals or dogs or, um, or the work you do in your church or love for the environment and, and really caring, that all of these separate things are actually part of a whole. They're all part of a whole, and that's what makes also very important what you're doing in terms of Turtle Island, because it is part of, of a larger whole. And if we really understood better how all life is connected on this earth, yes, and all differences actually come into are, are part of, of, of a total spirituality, and that therefore everything is important, right. and why racism makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah. And, and, and differences are something that one has to look at as if they could teach you. They could teach you so much, mm -hmm. and you can learn. And um, so I've been always very fascinated by what I've uh, read about uh, Native Americans, because this is what I have sensed mm -hmm. in this extraordinary relationship that all Native Americans had to nature, and an understanding and an identification with nature on a level that, that we have lost, I think, probably mm -hmm. all one loses, yeah. actually. You think you're gaining so much in the way of civilization mm -hmm. and this and that, but there's also... Yeah, the I want to say, I wanna say a, yeah. two things about that. I think that uh, I talk a little bit about this one experience that I had in the book where um, I was really learning to see the energy field that surrounded other living beings. I was going through that process. I was fairly young at the time, and you know, following that experience of really being enmeshed in, in a very real way, the awareness of our connectivity to one another, the complete elimination of the firm lines that separate our being. Um, a short time later, I was driving down the road on the main street of my town and, you know, looking at a lot of mullets and jean jackets and and thinking, you know, things don't really change here. You know, people look exactly the same here as they did 20 years ago. And um, all of a sudden it occurred to me that that was a really uncharitable thought and I was judging them. And in the moment that I had that realization, it's like time froze and every face turned to look at me. People in the cars beside me, people walking on the streets, everybody turned and looked at me for like a split second. 
And every single face that I saw was my own face. Every set of eyes looking at me were my own eyes. And so that made me understand that not only are we all connected, but we really are one living being having a simultaneous experience of ourselves individually. And so when I think about that and I think about, you know, um, people who think in a way that is fundamentally different than I think, people who are consciously choosing to harm life, people who are consciously destroying the earth, what I think about is how would I want to meet myself on the path, okay? So if we're truly all one living being, if the eyes looking back at me are truly my own, if we're truly, you know, all uh, related in Dilna Bamuk, then that person who's suffering from a spiritual illness, in my opinion, where they believe in the illusion of separation and entitlement and dominance over life, that is a spiritual illness and a mental illness. And if that is me or my beloved kin, how do I want to engage that individual? If somebody that I love was suffering from a mental illness and was out there and they were lost and someone came across them, would I want them to get into their face and scream at them and tell them that they were evil for being lost? Would I want them to attack them and harm their bodies because they were lost and suffering from mental illness? Or would I want them to lovingly engage them and guide them back home? And that's really where we're at. And so when I think about the long history of conscious evolution that we're all involved in, we're all in the midst of this process of the evolution of our consciousness collectively. And I think about the examples that we have in the natural world. So when you look at beings within the natural world, because we're really just creatures in the natural world. I don't know if anybody told you, but it's true. You know, we're just creatures in the natural world. And so when you look at the creatures who are still connected to the natural world, when they're sick, they know exactly where to go to get the medicine that they need. Right? The animals know exactly which plants they need to eat when they're sick. The people who live close to the earth know that uh, wherever there's a poison right next to it is the antidote in the natural world. And so, how many of you have ever had a fever? So is a, is a fever a symptom of illness? A lot of people think that a fever is a symptom of illness and they try to medicate it. But a fever is actually a symptom of healing. And so, how many of you have ever had some type of infection and had to get an antibiotic and the first time you take the antibiotic you feel like uh, you know there's a war going on inside of your body where you feel so much sicker than you did before you took it there's that space in between when you're really sick and you're getting well there's that space in between that's just awful So there's this thing that's called a homeopathic response. Have you ever heard of that? And so what a homeopathic response is that when you actually take the medicine that's going to make you better, you get worse first. And so that's also called in spiritual healing arenas, uh, a shamanic response. So we often have this shamanic or homeopathic response to the very thing that is going to heal us. And so we're, you know, we're one living family. 
and we're dispersed throughout the world. And there's one group of our relatives who wandered off and they picked up an illness. They picked up a mental and spiritual illness that made them believe in otherness, that made them believe in separation, that made them believe that uh, there is this thing called manifest destiny. Delusions of the mind, illness of the spirit. And so they're off and they're operating under their delusional mindset. But their spirit knows that they're sick, just like the body of the creatures in the natural world that know that they're sick and they know to go eat a plant that's going to make them better. So they're off wandering around, conquering one land after another, and there's something calling within them. They can't ever feed it, no matter how much they conquer, right? This alarm that's going off within them, this insatiable hunger. And they keep driving and driving and driving to try to soothe that ache within them that's caused by this illusion of separation, this detachment from the nourishment of the umbilical connection to Mother Earth. They're starving to death. And so their spirit puts out a signal and listens and hears this heartbeat, right? They hear this heartbeat and they recognize that that's that heartbeat connected to the umbilical of Mother Earth. And they start following that sound and it leads them to this land. And here is the source of their healing. Here is the maintained connection to the source of life. Here is a way of being that is still connected to harmonious, balanced respect for all creation. Here is the stripping away of this illusion of separation from the rest of the world. And what we've seen here over the past five, six hundred years has been the homeopathic and shamanic response to the source of that healing. So we have this mental and spiritual illness that makes us believe in separation and entitlement. We have this understanding of interrelatedness, web of life, quantum entanglement, fundamental laws of the universe over here. Very simplistic looking. And when those two cultures collided, the culture who was believing in the myth, the lie, the delusion of separation, erupted into a violent fever. And it ravaged the body of humanity. When somebody's in a fever, they're flailing all around, they're having fits oftentimes. That's what we saw happening. An arm flails over here, and we see a repetition of the genocide that happened here, happening in other parts of the world. It's acting out before us right now in the Middle East. There's an arm that flails over here. An increase, a marked increase in the slave trade for the forming of this country. You know, and when we look at that flailing body and the places that it's kicked and hit along the way, we can see the evidence of that damage. And now that fever is starting to calm. There are only a few sick cells left within the body of humanity. And how do we heal 
What happens when we have a wound? The red blood cells rush to that place. So not only do we need to become shaman, we need to become red blood cells. We need to go to those diseased places and we need to heal what's rising up, showing us that it needs healing. Because I'm gonna tell you a secret. Governments didn't just start stealing native lands. It's not new. The police who were actually created to control slaves didn't just start killing black men on the streets of this country. Racial tensions are not new. Belief in superiority of one group over another, whether that group be uh, social or religious or have any other association is not new. What's new is that we have the capacity to communicate with one another in a way that we never have before. But also, we're at an age where the sun is at high noon because we are in the process of birthing a new way of being. We are in the process of healing ourselves and taking another evolutionary leap. And so everything that has been in shadow has now come into the light because the sun is at high noon. And it's coming into the light because we finally have the connectivity and the capacity with our knowledge of ourselves as creators of the reality that we inhabit to heal those things. And so that is the work of our lives. None of us are born into this time by accident. We were born as ourselves in this time for this reason specifically because we all have a role to play in the unfolding of this new way of being that we're going to share together down the road. And so it's really an honor for me to be able to walk this path with you. And so I think we're gonna probably end there. It's probably time, right? Yeah, uh, we're gonna end there and I'm gonna say, Kachiwili uh, one need up snubba. Uh, Nita Besks, thank you so much. And uh, Basilda and Dilna Bamak for all my relations. Thank you.